Hi everyone, we have a very special 107 Facts video for you today. This was made by our friend David Levin, who happens to be the biggest Back to the Future fan we have ever met. So without further ado, take it away, David Levin. Well, here we are in 2015. Doc Brown and Marty McFly should be showing up any day now to do something about Marty's kids. So while we're waiting, I'm David, and here are 107 facts you should know about Back to the Future. Oh, and if you're the one person in this time continuum who has never seen the movie, go watch it and then come back. Of course, there are spoilers ahead. So strap in. When this episode hits number 88, you're going to see some serious shit. Number one. Back to the Future was directed by Robert Zemeckis and written by him and Bob Gale. Number two. They met at USC Film School in 1971, then went on to write cheesy 70s shows like Kolchak the Night Stalker and Get Christy Love. Number three, they later wrote the Steven Spielberg comedy flop, 1941. Number four, 23-year-old Michael J. Fox was everyone's first choice to play Marty McFly. At the time, he was the popular star of the hit sitcom Family Ties. Unfortunately, the producer of that show, Gary David Goldberg, told Steven Spielberg, no way, they couldn't have Fox while the TV show was in production. Number five. So producers continued their search for Marty. Also considered for the role, Johnny Depp, Corey Hart, C. Thomas Howell, Ralph Macchio, John Cusack, and believe it or not, Charlie Sheen. Number six. Finally, they settled on Eric Stoltz, the hunky star of Mask and Some Kind of Wonderful, to play Marty. And settled was the operative word. Producers still wanted Fox, but Universal executive Sid Scheinberg was so sure Stoltz was the right guy, he told producers that if Stoltz didn't work out, they could replace him. Number seven. From the beginning, Stoltz was a little bit of a problem. Stoltz was a method actor, and while on set, he insisted that everyone call him Marty. He wouldn't even answer to his own name. Number eight. After six weeks of shooting, both Steven Spielberg and Bob Zemeckis said enough's enough. The talented actor didn't have the comic chops that Zemeckis was looking for. Number nine. Stoltz didn't take it well. One online account said Spielberg approached him saying, Eric, I need to talk to you. Stoltz replied, I'm Marty. No, said Spielberg, you're Eric and you're fired. It's too bad that account is false. I kind of like it. They actually did try to be nice about it, but Stoltz threw a fit anyway. Number 10. However it happened, it reportedly cost $3 million to reshoot all of Stoltz's scenes with Michael J. Fox. Number 11. But Stoltz may have actually made it into the finished movie. Twice. Once, when Marty jumps into the DeLorean in the yellow radiation suit. And second, when Marty punches Biff in the face. According to Tom Wilson, who played Biff, that was Eric Stoltz's fist. He said they never filmed that particular angle with Michael J. Fox. Number 12. Gary David Goldberg reluctantly agreed to let Fox do the film on the condition that he not miss any work on Family Ties. So Fox pulled double duty while shooting the film. Family Ties during the day from 9 till 6, Back to the Future from 6 till 2 a.m. He slept in the back of a van on the way home and started all over again the next day. This sucked for the Back to the Future crew, who shot everything except Fox's scenes until he arrived on set. As for Fox, he said, I'm 22. What do I need sleep for? Number 13. Zemeckis knew he had his Marty when, on Fox's first night of shooting, he nailed this line. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? Number 14. Here's another bit of recasting you might not have known about. Okay, most people know that Claudia Wells, who played Jennifer in Back to the Future Part 1, was replaced by Elizabeth Shue for Part 2 and 3. Claudia was unavailable. She had to take care of her mom, who had cancer. But what you may not have known was that Claudia almost didn't get the part after she already had it. Wait a minute, follow us for a minute. It gets a little tricky. Originally, Claudia was cast as Jennifer for the first film. But when the movie started shooting with Eric Stoltz, she was unavailable because she had gotten cast in a sitcom. So another actress, Melora Hardin, who eventually went on to do The Office, was cast to play Jen. But when Michael J. Fox entered the picture, Hardin was too tall for him. So Claudia Wells, now available again, since that sitcom got canceled, was brought back to play Jennifer. All clear? No? Well, it's not that important. Number 15. Claudia did get to reprise her role as Jennifer, decades later. 
this time in the video game of Back to the Future. Number 16. Tim Robbins was one of the people up for the part of Biff. Number 17. Christopher Lloyd originally didn't want to do the film until he was talked into it by a friend. Number 18. Now, try to imagine Doc Brown played by Jeff Goldblum, or John Lithgow, or James Woods. All were considered for the part. Number 19. Christopher Lloyd says he modeled Doc Brown after a combination of Albert Einstein and Leopold Stokowski. Number 20. Besides the Back to the Future sequels, Christopher Lloyd has reprised his Doc Brown role numerous times. For the Huey Lewis Power of Love music video, for the Universal theme park ride, a Nike ad, several foreign electronics commercials, a Simpsons theme park ride, the Back to the Future cartoon show, the very popular video game, and in Seth MacFarlane's comedy, A Million Ways to Die in the West. Number 21. But Lloyd did not do the voice of Doc Brown for the cartoon, though. Only the live action sequences. The cartoon voice was done by Dan Castellaneta, who's also the voice of Homer Simpson. Number 22. Later, of course, Lloyd worked with Zemeckis again in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Number 23. Zemeckis worked with many members of his Back to the Future team again, including composer Alan Silvestri, who also did the scores for Zemeckis' Roger Rabbit, Forrest Gump, Castaway, Contact, Romancing the Stone, Death Becomes Her, What Lies Beneath, The Polar Express, and Flight. Number 24. Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd reunited for an episode of Fox's sitcom, Spin City. Number 25. Musician Huey Lewis, who wrote and performed the two hits from the film, The Power of Love and Back in Time, appears as the Battle of the Bands judge who calls Marty's music too darn loud. Number 26. The Power of Love was Huey Lewis and the News' first number one hit, staying at the top of the charts for two weeks. In the summer of 85, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing the song. Number 27. Michael J. Fox practiced the guitar for his big rock star scene with an audio tape of Johnny B. Good playing at half speed. Number 28. Johnny B. Good almost didn't make it into the film since the performance stopped the story dead in its tracks. Number 29. Though originally Chuck Berry didn't want his song in the film, he changed his mind when he was paid around $50,000. Number 30. Michael J. Fox's singing in the film was actually done by Mark Campbell, who was credited as Marty McFly, Fox lip sync. Number 31. Crispin Glover also lip synced much of his part. He was so nervous during filming that he lost his voice and had to re-record his lines in the studio. What? Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd also had to do a bit of re-recording. The aircraft engines needed to generate winds for the dramatic storm sequence were also just too darn loud. No one could hear them scream. Number 33. By the way, Doc Brown might have been screaming because he really is up high on the tower, hung from a harness. And Christopher Lloyd was afraid of heights. Today, that shot would have been done with green screen. Number 34. It's gigawatts, not gigawatts. When writers Gale and Zemeckis did their research, the scientists they spoke to mispronounced the word, and thus, so did Doc Brown. Number 35. Marty asks for a Pepsi free. Though no longer made, at the time, it was one of the first caffeine-free colas. Number 36. He also asks for a tab, a diet cola, which has since been replaced by Diet Coke. Number 37. Actor Billy Zane of Titanic makes his screen debut in the movie as Match. He has no lines. Number 38. The girl who says, who is that, is Sachi Parker, the real-life daughter of Shirley MacLaine. Number 39. Burger King, at the beginning of the film, is not a product placement. Number 40. California Raisins, at the end of the film, is, though they got their money back since the sign was nearly unreadable. Number 41. Mr. Fusion originally was supposed to have a Westinghouse logo, but the company nixed it. Number 42. Instead of Calvin Klein, in the French translation, Marty is called Pierre Cardin. Number 43. In the Spanish translation, he's Levi Strauss. Number 44. Twin Pines Mall is actually Puente Hills Mall in City of Industry, California. Number 45. Marty is reportedly named after a production assistant Zemeckis and Gale had on their movie Used Cars. 
Number 46. 1955 was the year of the big Davy Crockett craze. The show was a huge hit on TV. Number 47. This clock foreshadows the big scene with Doc Brown later in the film. It's a model of silent star Harold Lloyd, no relation we presume, in the classic comedy Safety Last. Number 48. Michael J. Fox did a public service announcement in Australia telling kids riding behind cars on skateboards is dangerous. So is going 88 miles per hour in a parking lot, kids. Don't try it at home. Number 49. A few of the shots of Einstein in the car were really a stuntman in a dog posture. Number 50. Doc Brown's middle name is Lathrop. If you say Emmett Lathrop backwards, it sort of sounds like Time Portal. Number 51. If you think about it too hard, the Marty we see jump into the DeLorean at the end of the film is probably not the same version of Marty we see throughout the movie. It's a version of Marty that grew up in a fairly prosperous household with well-adjusted parents. The loop that gets set up there is enough to melt your brain. How is that Marty going to muck up the past? Best not to dwell. Number 52. The 1955 clock tower chime is the same one that was used in the 1960 movie The Time Machine, based on the H.G. Wells novel. Number 53. Marty's middle name is Seamus. Number 54. The TV version of Back to the Future changes the word assholes to jerks. Now, what happens to us in the future? What, do we become jerks or something? Number 55. The door of the DeLorean accidentally kept hitting Michael in the head during production. Number 56. The bum on the bench in 1985 was the guy running for mayor in 1955. Number 57. The classic Honeymooners episode Marty Watches actually first aired December 31st, 1955 nearly two months after this scene supposedly takes place. Number 58. Tom Biff Wilson gets asked so many questions about Back to the Future that he now hands out postcards with FAQs. Number 59. The song Mr. Sandman was a number one hit in 1954 when it was recorded by the Cordettes. In Back to the Future, the version that's playing is by the Four Aces, which only hit number five, though in the UK it did hit number one. Number 60. Princess Diana attended the British premiere in 1985. Number 61. Lorraine's younger brother in 1955 was played by Jason Hervey, who later played the older brother on a show that took place in the 1970s, The Wonder Years. Number 62. To prepare for her role, each day Leah Thompson would immerse herself in her dressing room with magazines from the mid-1950s while playing music from the period. Number 63. The novelization of the movie, written from an early draft screenplay, contains many scenes that were changed or never made it into the final film. Number 64. Michael J. Fox and Crispin Glover had actually worked together before on an episode of Family Ties. Number 65. Biff's last name, Tannen, is based on a real-life studio executive, Ned Tannen. Number 66. Though it's a comic book that never existed in real life, Tales from Space number 8 actually turns up in an episode of Third Rock from the Sun. Number 67. It does have an EC logo. In the 1950s, EC Comics was a real comic company, which published Tales from the Crypt, which later became an HBO series that Robert Zemeckis produced. See how it all goes around? Number 68. At one point, Universal executive Sid Sheinberg wanted the title of the movie changed to Spaceman from Pluto. Steven Spielberg helped the producers head off that potential disaster by sending off a note to Scheinberg thanking him for the laughs everyone got at his very clever joke. Number 69. Scheinberg did get a few changes through, though. Einstein, Doc Brown's dog, was originally going to be a chimp named Shemp. Number 70. And Scheinberg asked producers to name Marty's mother after Scheinberg's wife, Lorraine Gary. Gary had acted in two of Spielberg's other films, Jaws, and 1941. Number 71. Lorraine's original name was going to be Eileen, and at one point, Meg. Number 72. Scheinberg also suggested that they change Professor Brown to Doc Brown. Number 73. Scheinberg was also responsible for changing the film's release date. Originally planned for a late August 85 release, when Scheinberg saw the overwhelming reaction to the previews, he pushed the release up to July 3rd, meaning producers had less than nine weeks to finish the film after shooting was done. Number 74. Because of that, 
Director Robert Zemeckis was reportedly a little unhappy with some of the effects, including this shot of Marty's hand disappearing. Number 75. When Back to the Future was pitched, raunchy teen comedies were all the rage, like Risky Business and Porky's. Recent time travel movies like Somewhere in Time and Time Bandits were box office poison. So the film was turned down by every major studio, sometimes more than once, sometimes for not being dirty enough. Number 76. Executives at Disney went the other way and squawked that the mother-son relationship was too risque. Number 77. Eventually, the success of Robert Zemeckis' film Romancing the Stone, as well as a nudge by producer Steven Spielberg, got the second look the film needed, and Universal gave the green light. Number 78. Back to the Future was not the first time Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale wrote the line, Get your goddamn hands off her. It was also uttered by Mark McClure in their film, I Wanna Hold Your Hand. Get Goddamn hands off for you. McClure later appears in Back to the Future as Marty's brother, Dave McFly. Number 79. Another I Want to Hold Your Hand alumni, Wendy Jo Sperber, plays Marty's sister, Linda. Number 80. Hill Valley High School was actually shot at Whittier High School in Whittier, California, which was the real-life alma mater of the man who was vice president in 1955, Richard Nixon. Number 81. It took three hours in makeup to transform the beautiful 24-year-old Leah Thompson into the frumpy 47-year-old Lorraine McFly. Number 82. The numbers on Doc Brown's amplifier, CRM-114, is an homage to Stanley Kubrick, who for some reason used that number in both Dr. Strangelove and 2001 A Space Odyssey. It also turns up in A Clockwork Orange. Number 83. You can still see the set for Hill Valley on the Universal Studios tour. Although the set has caught fire multiple times, including one that burned down the courthouse in 1996 after it was struck by lightning. Number 84. Shooting on the Universal backlot allowed producers a lot of freedom. First, they set up and shot 1955. Then they trashed the place to do the 1985 segments. Number 85. That backlot set has been used in numerous films and TV shows. Bet you've seen them, including Bye Bye Birdie, The Music Man, the Incredible Hulk, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Bruce Almighty, The Ghost Whisperer, Gremlins, To Kill a Mockingbird, and the very first episode of The Twilight Zone. Number 86. The rock group Van Halen would not give producers the right to use the name of the band in the Darth Vader from Vulcan sequence. Instead, the Walkman plays a piece of music Eddie Van Halen composed especially for the film, although he now calls it just a bunch of noise. And it's his name not the bands, on the audio cassette. Number 87, Biff's signature lines, so make, make like, like a, a tree, tree and get, get out of out. here. What are you looking at, butthead? And butthead were improvised by actor Tom Wilson. And at last, number 88. 88 miles per hour has no special significance. It was just a random number that producers thought was easy to remember. Number 89. An avid Back to the Future fan once tested a car in the parking lot of the real-life Lone Pines Mall, but was unable to rev it up to the 88 miles per hour in the amount of room available in the parking lot. Number 90. By the way, actual DeLoreans only had a speedometer that went up to 85. The speedometer in the film had to be modified to go up to 95. Number 91. Five DeLoreans were used in the making of the movie, plus a special one constructed to be taken apart to film interiors. Number 92. Only 9,200 DeLoreans were ever made in the first place between 1981 and 1983. Number 93. The retail price of a DeLorean in 1981 was $25,000. That's about $68,000 today. Number 94. Someone at Universal's product placement department told them if they changed the car into a Mustang, Ford would pay $75,000 for the placement. The producers balked, saying Doc Brown would never drive a Mustang. Number 95. After he saw the movie, John DeLorean sent a thank you note to the producers for presenting the DeLorean car as the vehicle of the future. Number 96. In the original script, the time machine was going to be a refrigerator powered by a nuclear explosion. Steven Spielberg nixed this idea, concerned that kids would start playing in old refrigerators. 
It didn't seem to bother him too much when he later used the same idea in the fourth Indiana Jones movie. Maybe he knew no one would want to see that movie. Number 97. Who's president of the United States in 1985? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan? The actor? President Ronald Reagan loved Back to the Future. Producers asked for White House permission to use the line about Reagan in the film, and he enjoyed the film so much that not only did he request a copy of the film for the White House, but he also incorporated a line from the film in his State of the Union address. As they said in the film, Back to the Future, where are we going? We don't need roads. Number 98. The skateboarding sequences in the film were choreographed by a European skateboard champion, Per Wellender. God, I hope I pronounced that right. Not Tony Hawk, as some websites have reported. Number 99. Producers have said that there will never be a Back to the Future sequel, remake, or reboot. But they are working in London right now on a Back to the Future Broadway musical. Number 100. When Marty goes back to 1955, leaving from Twin Pines Mall, he runs over a baby pine tree. When he returns to 1985, the mall is now called Lone Pine Mall. I noticed this the second time I saw the movie. Number 101. In 1955, Marty is confronted by the farmer who owns the pine tree, Old Man Peabody, and his son Sherman. These characters are named after the time-traveling cartoon characters Peabody and Sherman. Why did it take me 30 years to figure this one out? 102. The film was inspired by Bob Gale's father's high school yearbook, when Gale wondered if he and his dad would have been friends if they had actually met in high school. Number 103. Marty goes back to November 5th, which is the birthday of writer Bob Gale's father. Not that you care, but in a weird coincidence, the date of the Enchantment Under the Sea dance, November 12, 1955, is the actual day my parents got married. Number 104. Also on November 12, 1955, Chuck Berry was named Billboard's most promising R&B artist. Number 105. The film was the top box office hit in 1985, beating Rambo, Cocoon, Breakfast Club, and Rocky IV. Number 106. Ultimately, the three films in the franchise have made over a billion dollars, which in 1955 dollars would come out to about $113,707,987.66. Whew! And finally, 107. Back to the Future was not originally intended to have any sequel. Doc, we better back up. We don't have enough roads to get up to 88. Roads? Well, we're going, we don't need roads. That's right. Even though the film eventually spawned two sequels, it was supposed to be a one-off. But the film proved to be so popular that when it was released on home video, producers added the graphic to be continued at the end of the movie. That's not something you'd see in the theatrical release or on the DVD release. And who knows, maybe we'll do 107 facts you need to know about Back to the Future 2 and 3. See you then. Thank you for watching everyone and a very special thank you to David Levin for putting this together for us. If you liked this video, remember to check back here for more 107 Fact videos and other videos about your favorite movies and television. We're trying to get back to a regular schedule and we should be there soon, so stay tuned for more.